In this unit, we will look at the process of inflammation and repair. By means of introduction, acute inflammation is a localized response to either an injury or a break in our defense mechanisms. This could be any type of physical or chemical agent or any type of microbial agent such as bacteria and viruses. Inflammation is characterized by redness, heat, pain, and swelling at the damage site. You will see the same result regardless of the causative agent. For this reason, inflammation is known as a nonspecific response. Doesn't matter what the causative agent is, you will always respond with redness, heat, pain, and swelling. The functions of inflammation include first and foremost to try to destroy the causative agent and remove it from the body. However, there are times when the agent cannot be removed, therefore inflammation attempts to limit its effect on the body. Finally, inflammation process will repair or replace the damaged tissue. There are two main stages in inflammation. One is the vascular component where you will see an increase in blood flow to the damaged area as well as an increased permeability of the blood vessels within the area. This stage is responsible for the redness, heat, and swelling. Redness because you're getting more blood flow to that area, heat because this blood is coming from warmer areas of the core, and swelling due to the increased permeability which allows fluid to escape into the surrounding tissues. The other stage you will see a large number of white blood cells move into the tissue spaces so they can inactivate the causative agent and remove the debris. This will result in the formation of exudate. Exudate refers to the movement of fluid and anything suspended within that fluid as well as cells into the surrounding tissues. Looking a little bit closer at the vascular factors that are involved with this exudate formation. First is hyperemia and stasis. Almost immediately after an injury, blood flow patterns will change. Hyperemia refers to an increase in blood flow. The precapillary sphincters that are supplying the damaged area will dilate. This will allow an increase in blood flow to the area by reducing vascular resistance to flow. Shortly after hyperemia develops, other capillaries and venules in the area will also dilate. The consequences of this, you will see an increase in blood pressure in that area. This will cause tissue fluid formation along the length of the capillaries. The increase in pressure forces the fluid out of the vessels into the tissues. This is what causes the swelling and also may cause pain due to the increased pressure and tension on nerve endings in the area. As fluid is lost from the blood, this will cause the viscosity or thickness of the blood to increase. As the blood thickens, it will slow down the flow rate. Stasis refers to when the flow becomes so slow that it will actually stop. With stasis, this elevates the capillary blood pressure even more and contributes further to exudate formation by causing more fluid to move out of the blood. You also see an increase in permeability in the damaged area. Remember capillaries consist of a single layer of simple squamous endothelial cells surrounded by a basement membrane. These endothelial cells will contract slightly after the injury and this will form narrow gaps between the cells and cause those gaps to become even wider. This allows more fluid to leave as well as proteins and the white blood cells. This picture compares both a normal capillary and one in a damaged area. Normal capillary, we can see the single layer of endothelial cells with the basement membrane. There are small gaps there, but after damage, you can see the endothelial cells have contracted, widening those gaps. This allows more fluid and proteins to escape and also creates gaps that are large enough to allow the white blood cells to escape. This is just a flow chart showing what happens after tissue injury, basically putting what we just talked about into a flow chart. So there is a tissue damage. This causes the vessels to dilate, which will increase the blood pressure, which causes fluid to escape into the tissue spaces. Other, and we also see an increased permeability, which allows proteins to escape and contributes to the fluid loss. Over time, this is going to reduce the blood flow 
and could even result in stoppage of flow. What are the benefits of this exudate formation? One, it dilutes out any toxins, if that happens to be the causative agent. It will dilute harmful substances to further reduce the damage. Secondly, the increased pain from swelling will force one to limit the use of the affected area. The increased permeability allows antibodies also to get into the injury site. Normally, they stay in the blood. Antibodies are proteins, so with the increased permeability, this allows more proteins to escape. The high concentration of protein, other proteins that also escape help to promote phagocytosis and activate the, the neutrophils and macrophages in the area. Inflammation is classified based on the type of fluid exudate and the severity of injury. Serous inflammation, only fluid escapes but not proteins. This is a typical response to a mild injury. For example, when you do get a watery blister after a minor burn. Purulent or superlative inflammation is due to a more serious injury or due to a potent toxin. Now the fluid will contain a large number of neutrophils as well as dead and dying cells and necrotic debris. This forms a very thick fluid exudate called pus. It is referred to as cellulitis if it is relatively diffuse and an abscess if it is more localized. A cyst refers to a fluid-filled sac usually formed after the inflammatory response has removed the causative problem. Hemorrhagic inflammation is when the injury is very severe and now you see red blood cells and an increase in cellular, cellular debris in the fluid and surrounding tissues. Next, we're going to look at some of the cellular factors in exudate formation. This involves the circulating leukocytes, especially the neutrophils. This entire process is referred to as leukocyte emigration because they are going to emigrate to the area of damage. First stage is margination. During normal blood flow, the cells exhibit what is referred to as axial flow. What this means is that the formed elements move in a central column parallel to the long axis of the vessel. The leukocytes are going to be closest to the center of this column because they are the largest and the heaviest of the cells. And the platelets will be near the outside because they are the smallest and lightest. Plasma then surrounds this column. Margination occurs as fluid is lost and the flow rate begins to decrease. So what happens? First, the column enlarges so that its border comes closer to the endothelial lining. The loss of fluid causes red blood cells to begin to clump up. These clumps are now the largest cells and the heaviest, so they move to the center of the column. Leukocytes now appear smaller and are forced to the outer position. Second step is pavementing and adhesion. Pavementing is the adherence of the leukocytes to the endothelial surface in the area of injured vascular tissue. The reason this happens is because the endothelium becomes sticky when damaged. The stickiness increases with the severity of the injury. This is an important step because it sets the leukocytes up so that they can be transported into the tissue spaces. Next step is emigration and diapedesis. This refers to the movement of the leukocytes into the tissues. I will describe this picture. All the words that describe this are on the following slide. So again, we see our capillary in the damaged area. The gaps have gotten slightly wider between the endothelial cells. So what happens? The leukocytes will first migrate along the endothelial lining until they find a gap between the cells. They squeeze themselves out between the, those cells and are now between the endothelial cells and the basement membrane. They then begin to creep along until they find a break in the, the basement membrane. And then they squeeze themselves out into the tissues. So once again, emigration. The leukocytes slide along that endo, endothelial surface until they reach a gap. That gap widens slightly so that the leukocytes will be able to squeeze out. The leukocytes next move along the basement membrane until they find a way that they can pass into the tissues. This entire process takes approximately 10 minutes. 
The term diapedesis is often also used to describe this above movement, but it also is used to describe the movement of red blood cells. Red blood cells will also be forced out by the high blood pressure. These usually die and then just end up being one more thing that has to be removed by the macrophages. Now what cells are dominant? The neutrophils are the first to arrive, the first responders. Main reason is because there are more of them in the general circulation, plus they are ready to function as is. Later monocytes show up. They leave the blood and develop into macrophages once they are in the tissues. Monocytes are not mature. They do not finish their maturation process until they get into the tissues where they become the macrophages. Macrophages are very large in size and have an increased ability to carry on phagocytosis. As the number of macrophages increase in the tissues, you will begin to see the number of neutrophils decrease. Why does this happen? Again, as I said, there are more neutrophils in the circulation, so there are more initially available to emigrate. Once in the tissues, neutrophils only survive for a very short time. Macrophages have the ability to survive a much longer period. Chemotactic agents initially will attract both cells to the site of damage, and then later on they attract mainly the monocytes. It is also felt, uh, believed that macrophages have the ability to replicate once they are in the tissues. So not only do they survive longer, but they can also increase their numbers once in the tissues. Now that we have the white cells in the tissues, the next step is phagocytosis. This will result in removing the damaged cells, infectious agents, and immune complexes, as well as debris. The first step in phagocytosis is chemotaxis. You will see an increase in concentration in chemotactic agents in the inflamed tissue. These materials will attract the phagocytic cells and they will start to migrate to it. The term chemotaxis refers to the movement of phagocytic cells toward a high concentration of these agents. Chemo is a chemical, taxis is movement, so chemotaxis, movement in response to a chemical. Now, why do they believe that these cells will move toward these agents? They have shown that leukocytes actually have membrane receptors for the agent. Then, once the agent binds to these receptors, the cells become activated or turned on. They get larger, more active, with more destructive agents stored inside, so better able to carry on phagocytosis and destroy the causative agent. Next is recognition and attachment. A process known as opsonization occurs to help speed up what is normally a very slow process. Opsonization means coating of any foreign particle with materials from the plasma. These materials from the plasma are referred to as opsins. Opsins have binding sites also for the leukocytes and basically look at this as these opsins will make the foreign particles appear more tasty for the leukocytes as well as easier for them to grab since they have receptors for them. Next is engulfment and destruction. The phagocytic cell will send out pseudopods to engulf the foreign particle. This results in a formation of a phagocytic vacuole within the cytoplasm. This is known as a phagosome. A lysosome, which is a, di a, a digestive vacuole or a di uh, filled with digestive enzymes, will fuse with the vacuole and form a phagal lysosome or a digestive vacuole. Lysosomal enzymes will be released into this vacuole. The cell is said to become degranulated as more and more lysosomes fuse with the phagosome. If the particle is too large for our phagocytic cell to engulf, the leukocyte, the white blood cell, will undergo what is known as frustrated phagocytosis. It becomes frustrated because it cannot engulf and uh, carry on phagocytosis the way it wants to. So what it does, it will release toxic materials or degradative substances into the surrounding tissues to try and break down the particle. Imagine when you have a sliver. The sliver is causing inflammation. Phagocytic cells will respond, but it is much too large for them to engulf. So they get frustrated and try to release other substances to destroy the material. 
This is just a, a picture or diagram illustrating the process. Here is the agent the cell is going to destroy. Chemotaxis, okay, the two are moving toward each other. And then the phagocytic cell sends out pseudopods to engulf it into a phagosome. Lysosomes fuse with that phagosome, digest and destroy the particle, and then release the waste products. This process takes roughly 20 minutes from start to finish for a phagocytic cell to completely destroy a microorganism. So the role of these phagocytic cells, first and foremost, to try and kill the microorganisms. They will try to destroy or inactivate toxic agents and also degrade macromolecules. When they destroy microorganisms, the killing process is done via two mechanisms. One is through oxygen independent means. Here, substances will be released that damage the cell walls of the bacteria, disrupt their replication, and lower the pH. Afterwards, they will then digest whatever remains using other enzymes. The other process is oxygen dependent. Here, the phagocytic cells release oxygen metabolites, such as hypochlorous acid, which is more commonly known as Clorox, and other hydroxyl radicals. These materials will kill and break down the bacteria. This is just showing some of these agents and how these various agents work. We are going to talk about some of these specific agents in more detail. All right, so what triggers all of these changes that we have talked about thus far? Well, the injury initially causes certain chemical substances to be produced and released at the site of injury. An initiator is anything that will initiate the events or start this process. It could be trauma, it could be an infection, it could be injured cells, antigen-antibody complexes, etc. These initiators all achieve their results indirectly through chemical mediators. <coughs> all initiators, regardless of where they come from, will produce the same response. Again, this is why it is referred to as a nonspecific response. Some of these mediators are cell-derived. They come from mast cells, neutrophils, macrophages, and platelets. They are either released preformed from cytoplasmic granules through a process known as degranulation, or the initiator will cause the cell to produce new mediators. Here are three examples of these chemical mediators. First is histamine. Histamine is derived from mast cells, and it is one of the materials responsible for the vasodilation and increased permeability at the site of damage. The next are chemotactic factors. These two come from mast cells. This is what lures the neutrophils to the site of injury. Both histamine and the chemotactic factors are preformed. They are in the cells ready to be released. This is why you see a very rapid response to, uh, uh, as far as vasodilation and increased permeability. As soon as damage occurs, these materials are ready to go and will be released, causing almost an immediate response. The last two examples, leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Leukotrienes also cause chemotaxis and an increase in permeability. Prostaglandins cause vasodilation and an increased permeability. These come from mast cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. They are not pre-made. The initiator will stimulate the production of these materials within these cells. They are all made from a material known as arachidonic acid. There are very, also various plasma-derived mediators. Most of these result from a series of activation steps called a cascade. There are four interrelated cascades that will lead to the inflammatory response or to coagulation. They are the blood coagulation cascade, the kinin cascade, fibrinolytic cascade, and the complement cascade. We have already looked at blood coagulation and the fibrinolytic cascade. This is showing how all four cascades interrelate. 
All four of these cascades are activated or initiated by the activation of a material called Hagman factor. This is actually clotting factor number 12. This will lead to uh, the beginning of the coagulation cascade, set into place the fibrinolytic cascade, and the kinin cascade. Down here is the complement cascade that also results uh, due to the fibrinolytic cascade being stimulated. When you look at this, only the Kinnon cascade is limited to, to controlling, directly controlling inflammation. Now, it looks like the complement cascade does as well, but the complement cascade does three things. Yes, it does initiate inflammation, but it can also directly destroy microorganisms and it helps to enhance the phagocytic activity. So the kinin cascade is the only one that directly affects inflammation. And the two main components of the kinin cascade, or one of the main components, sorry, of the kinin cascade is bradykinin. This material will also contribute to the pain of inflammation. Coagulation and the fibrinolytic cascade, their main uh, job is to control bleeding. All of these chemical mediators are released very rapidly, resulting in an aggressive response to injury, and then their concentration drops suddenly and will set the stage for healing. Sometimes there are systemic effects associated with acute inflammation. This includes fever, loss of appetite, an increase in deep sleep, and weakness. You can also see effects with the, the lymph vessels. Lymphadenitis, this refers to swollen lymph nodes. This is a sign that the white cells are doing their job and the lymph nodes are doing their job, filtering out bacteria and other causative agents. Lymphangitis is inflamed lymph vessels. And leukocytosis refers to an increase in the number of circulating leukocytes, also common associated with inflammation, increasing the numbers available to fight off the causative agent. Some therapeutic modifications. Well, why do we need to intervene? First, pain. This signals that there is a problem, but prolonged intense pain needs to be taken care of and dealt with. Swelling needs to be controlled if it impairs the function of a joint or an organ. Swelling also can result in pain. Tissue damage can result in further tissue damage if the neutrophils aren't controlled. For example, you can get immune complexes laid down that will signal the neutrophils, and then this will result in frustrated phagocytosis, resulting in further tissue damage. So they can actually end up starting to destroy healthy tissue as well as getting rid of the causative agents. So how can we intervene? One way is through temperature. When we apply cold to an area, this helps to decrease the swelling. It causes vasoconstriction, prevents heat loss, and will decrease the blood flow to the area. As a result, you will see less exudate and less swelling. Applying heat favors the phagocytosis. So general rule is to use cold early on to limit the swelling and later use heat to stimulate phagocytosis to clean up the damaged area. You can also use elevation and pressure. These two will limit the swelling. Elevation promotes uh, drainage and decreased swelling, also slowing the blood flow to the area. Pressure prevents fluid loss and in this way helps to control swelling. Drug therapy, antihistamines will block the action of histamine. NSAIDs, ibuprofen and aspirin, they all block prostaglandin uh, synthesis. They can also relieve pain by blocking the pain mediators such as bradykinin. Steroids have a much broader effect. They interfere with the release of arachidonic acid. So they will reduce swelling and minimize the damage from the phagocytic cells. Problem though is that some therapies can interfere with the healing process, so you need to be aware. Next we're gonna look at the process of a fever. Fever is an elevation of body temperature above the normal range. Typically, this is often seen accompanying inflammation. Now, in a fever, 
The temperature regulating control system is function functioning normally, but at a new set point. This regulating system is in the hypothalamus. In the hypothalamus, we have a, a set point temperature that uh, for our body, it's either 37 degrees uh, Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The hypothalamus monitors body temperature and will set into play various regulatory mechanisms to try and maintain this temperature. With a fever, that set point has been elevated slightly. So what happens is, again, the body thinks, okay, we need to be at this higher temperature and will set into play various processes to achieve that temperature. So the signs and symptoms of a fever prior to onset are the same as when body temperature falls before, below normal. Person will be pale and have chills. This is due to dermal vasoconstriction. The body is trying to generate heat to bring it up to this new set point. Once the normal set point is restored, heat loss mechanisms will go into work. This includes sweating and flushing, anything to try and dissipate this excess heat. The mechanisms underlying a fever, all external factors responsible for a fever stimulate a common response pattern that then acts to elevate the set point. One of these factors are exogenous pyrogens. The prototype of all exogenous pyrogens is an endotoxin known as LPS, lipopolysaccharide. This material is actually part of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria and is released when the bacteria are either injured or killed. This endotoxin is extremely heat stable. Also, if this material is injected, it results in what is known as injection fever. This was a common complication of IV fluids before they understood what this material was. So think about it. When a person has a fever, Okay. One of the common remedies is to take uh, medication to lower the fever, or if the fever is due to a bacterial infection, prescribe antibiotics to eliminate the bacteria. Now, if that fever was due to a gram-negative organism, when you take the antibiotics, initially you will begin to feel better, but then may spike a fever a day or so later. This is common. Think about it. Gram-negative bacteria have LPS in their cell wall. The medication, the antibiotics, are killing the bacteria and as a result releasing this LPS into the system. LPS will then result in a fever. Other materials, other that act as an, uh, exogenous pyrogens, viruses, other bacteria, fungi, Antigenic or toxic substances, also many therapeutic agents, can cause a fever either to, due to an excess dosage or if the patient is sensitive to the medication, it can result in a fever. The other component of a fever are endogenous pyrogens. Exogenous pyrogens cause a fever by stimulating the endogenous pyrogens. These then act on the hypothalamus, and they are the ones actually responsible for elevating the set point. What are these materials, and where do they come from? They come from neutrophils, lymphocytes, and macrophages. Some of the more common ones are interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, interferon alpha, and MIPI, which is macrophage inflammatory protein 1. How are these materials released? The endogenous pyrogens are produced and released by the phagocytic cells in the body in response to the exogenous pyrogens, or they can also be released due to direct trauma or injury. Some malignant tumors can also release endogenous pyrogens without any other stimuli. There is a lag period of roughly one hour between the stimulus of the phagocytic cells and the release of these endogenous pyrogens. But once released, the production can continue for upwards of 15 hours. Endogenous pyrogens are extremely potent. You need very small amounts of them to initiate a fever. What is the role of a fever? Many people believe that the higher body temperatures result in killing the bacteria. That is false. 
In order to kill the bacteria, the temperature we would need to achieve would also kill the person. What a fever does, the higher temperatures associated with the fever enhance the immune functions and phagocytosis. They rev up our immune system and also make our phagocytic cells much more active. Secondly, bacteria and viruses reproduce more slowly when the temperature is elevated. They don't like it when it's warm and they slow down. This makes it easier for our other defenses to take care of them. So the big question is, should we treat a fever or not? If a person is taking antibiotics, these will take care of one of the roles of the fever to eliminate the organisms. So go ahead and provide comfort to the patient and treat the fever. Fevers also need to be addressed because they can have numerous harmful effects on the, on the patient. Harmful side effects can occur in patients with compromised cardiac function. Tissues will increase their metabolic rate when they are warmer. There is a 13% increase in oxygen consum consumption for every one degree Celsius increase in body temperature. So think about it, 13% increase in oxygen consumption. That will significantly increase the workload on a heart that is already compromised. If the person has a head injury that interferes with the action of the hypothalamus, the fever can rise to dangerous levels. Healthy hypothalamus has, sets a max at about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. But if this mechanism is not functioning, fevers can rise to extremely dangerous levels. Fevers are also harmful during pregnancy. An increase in body core temperature may be harmful to the, fe uh, to the fetus. Therapies for fever, aspirin or acetaminophen, they work by inhibiting the synthesis of prostaglandins in the hypothalamus. This will block the set point elevation. However, if a fever is due to damage to the hypothalamus, these agents will have no effect. Ice baths can be used in emergency situations, and applying cold compresses to the forehead helps to cool the blood around the brain. So this is looking at the effect of aspirin and acetaminophen, affecting prostaglandin production, which will prevent the elevation of the set point in the hypothalamus. Lastly, we need to look at the healing process. Healing is closely associated with inflammation. The exudate that is formed through inflammation provides a medium in which healing can occur. There are two types of cells involved in the healing process. One are called the parenchymal cells. These are the functional cells of the tissue. The other are stroma. Stroma are the supporting connective tissue. So if you look at, for example, the liver, the parenchymal cells would be the hepatocytes. The stroma would be the connective tissue that holds these cells together. If we're looking at the skin, the parenchymal cells, the functional cells, would be the epithelial layer. The stroma would be the dermis and the hypodermis, the supporting tissue underneath. When, for example, uh, with the skin, when an injury occurs, if the healing process involves only the parenchymal cells, they know how to replace and, and become new epithelial cells. No scar will be seen. But if you involve the stroma or the supporting connective tissue, they don't know how to make epithelial cells. And this is when a scar can result. Regeneration refers to when tissue is replaced from the parenchymal cells via mitosis. The process continues until the newly formed tissue equals the tissue that was lost to injury. So again, parenchymal cells, they know how to make that particular tissue. No scar would be seen in uh, this type of a process. But tissues differ in their ability to regenerate. Labile tissues, they divide continually to replace cells that were lost through normal depletion. This includes uh, the bone marrow and lymphatic tissue. If injury occurs in these tissues, you will see an increase in the normal mitotic rate. A stable tissue is one that does not normally divide after adolescence. These cells still function throughout life. Therefore, they do not normally need to be replaced. You will only see an increase in mitosis when the tissue becomes damaged. 
This includes organs such as the liver, fibroblasts, and bone. Again, here is where uh, the, the uh, conditions I was talking about before would hold. If only the parenchymal cells are involved in the healing, the newly formed cells will organize themselves according to a pattern layout by the undamaged stroma. If the stroma is also involved, there's no pattern to follow. Regeneration will become disorganized, and this is when you may get a scar. The last type of tissue is a permanent tissue. They lose all mitotic ability shortly after birth. Loss or damage to this type of tissue will result in functional loss. So the only thing they can do is repair the damage by making scar tissue or connective tissue. These include nerves, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. When some cells are destroyed, others in the area may hypertrophy or enlarge to try and compensate, but most likely you will see scarring. So this is showing the regeneration process. Okay? Lay bile cells are ones with a much shorter period of function and they continue to divide and regenerate. Stable cells, they function for an extended period of time, but you will only see an increase in the growth rate when damage has happened. Permanent cells, they function continually, but they are blocked from being able to regenerate. We're going to look at the repair process. This is the process of laying down fibrous connective tissue to restore strength and structural integrity of damaged tissue that cannot regenerate. So as a result, you will get scar formation through a process called fibrosis. So we're going to look at the process in a tissue that cannot regenerate, how you get connective tissue laid down in replacement of tissue. You can also look at these steps uh, and you can think of the skin. We have a damage deep into the supporting connective tissue, the dermis or the hypodermis. And this is going to look at how that area will be repaired, filled in, and uh, ultimately healed. First thing that happens is you will get the formation of collagen fibers. This is the main event in the repair process. This is accomplished through fibroblasts, which are normally found in the stroma. Fibroblasts are extremely resistant to damage. They typically survive the injury, and if necessary, more will migrate to the damaged site. Fibroblasts will secrete a material called procollagen. Once secreted, this will be enzymatically altered to form long filaments of collagen. These collagen fibers will group together, forming a bundle. Newly formed collagen is weak, and it needs to build up strength. This strength comes from cross-linking fibers. These will provide tensile strength. Tensile strength, this is the strength that resists being pulled apart. All right, so this is in flow chart form. Fibroblasts secreting procollagen, creating the collagen fibers that align themselves in bundles, and then cross-linking occurs. In response to tension and pressure at the injury site, the collagen bundles will begin to realign themselves along lines of stress. This will provide additional strength. No new collagen needs to be made in order to do this. The ground substance, or the matrix, this refers to the fluid medium. This was formed by the exudate where the collagen forms. This material provides the intercellular material for scar tissue development. At first, it has a semi-solid consistency, but then fibroblasts will secrete a material called mucopolysaccharide into it, and this will begin to change its consistency. This fluid also helps to promote the process of collagen fiber production and cross-linking. Sometimes we also see the development of a clot. This is a gelled mass that forms when blood also escapes into the tissues during injury. This must be completely removed before healing can be completed. Removal refers to organization, which refers to the elimination of the clot via phagocytosis and then replacement with scar tissue. The next step is revascularization. One needs to restore the blood supply to the area. 
This is referred to as angiogenesis. Genesis is creation. Angio refers to the blood, uh, blood vessels. This process will also occur in the exudate. The first thing that is formed will be what is known as granulation tissue. The exudate will begin to take on a pink and granular appearance as new blood vessels begin to develop. Granulation tissue is an intermediate tissue and does not provide a lot of strength. New capillaries will be formed from intact vessels adjacent to the wound site. Endothelial cells from these vessels will migrate into the damaged area and form endothelial buds by mitosis. These project off of the parent vessel. These elongating buds can either loop back and reconnect with the parent vessel, they can fuse with a different vessel to form a completely new blood channel, but if the bud doesn't meet another vessel or goes beyond its nutrient supply of the parent vessel, it will degenerate and be cleared out by macrophages. This is just a picture showing these processes. So these are intact vessels on either side of the damage. The damage is between, the injured side is between. We see the buds coming off of the parent cells. So they can either go from side to side, creating a new channel. They can loop back to the parent, creating a new channel. Or a bud from one side can meet up with a bud from another side. And here we see one that has degenerated because it didn't create a new column. Next, we have to create a lumen. Cells in the bud will begin to enlarge and divide. Cells begin to form cytoplasmic vacuoles that enlarge and merge with vacuoles from adjacent cells. As more and more of these vacuoles fuse, eventually a lumen will be formed. Next, a series of changes will take place. Differentiation and rearrangement of these vessels will occur to form a vessel pattern similar to the normal tissue. Some will be modified to take on the structure of arterioles and others modified to become venules. They will build up a specific wall type from the inside out. Problem though is that newly formed vessels are leaky and this can add to the swelling even after the inflammatory response has decreased. You will also see establishment of lymphatic drainage. This starts later on and, the, and proceeds at a much slower rate than blood vessel formation. They will form the same way as capillaries. Initially, this vascularization process is greater than normal. More vessels will be made than are actually needed. This helps to meet the increased metabolic demand of the newly dividing tissue. Vascularization supply will decrease after healing is complete and many of these vessels will degenerate. This is why a new scar tends to be very pink and an older scar is more pale and blends in slightly better. You will also get new growth of vasomotor nerves during this process, but this can take several months to complete. The next stage of healing is re-epithelialization. This is the replacement of the lost surface lining. This is easy to accomplish because epithelial cells are labile. You will initially see a zone of active mitosis near the damaged edge. These new cells will begin to migrate across the wound surface. Migration will continue on the surface of the organizing granulation tissue. As the migration continues, the cells will begin to secrete a new basement membrane attaching them to the tissue below. When the cells from opposite sides meet, they become anchored to the basement membrane and then will alter their plane of division. These newly made cells now begin to move up away from the wound surface instead of over the top of it. Differentiation of these newly formed cells will occur to replace any specialized cell types in the tissue. So this is showing the process. So down below, underneath would be the where the new connective tissue has been laid down. These are epithelial cells on either side of the damage. So they begin to divide and creep along the surface of that new tissue. As they move, they are laying down a basement membrane. Once the two sides meet, their plane of division changes and they begin to move upwards to fill in the damaged area. 
Sometimes healing doesn't go always as planned, and there will be complications. A contracture is when newly formed collagen undergoes exaggerated contraction when the damage is extensive. This can result in distortion, which is uh, what we typically see associated with the disfiguration with many burns. It may also result in limiting in the mobility of an area, for example, burns on the skin of the neck and the hands. Contractures can have psychological effects, especially when the disfiguration involves the face. And sometimes it results in the formation of a stricture. This is a narrowing in the lumen of organs when the repair occurs in the wall of our tubular organs. This may result in slowing or stasis of the organ contents. Intestine stoppage, if this occurs here, can lead to an infection. This is a picture of a contracture. It looks like this person had surgery for a trigger finger and developed a contracture as a result. Another complication are adhesions. This is the joining of serous membranes. This results in fusing two membranes that used to move freely over each other. This can result in restriction in movement. Uh, this is common after surgery to the abdomen, heart, and lungs. Dehiscence, this is breaking open of a healing wound, usually due to pressure applied to the healing tissue. This is common with abdominal wounds due to the high pressure in the abdomen. This can result due to coughing, vomiting, or diarrhea. All will result in an increased chance of the wound reopening. The risk of dehiscence is that it can expose the abdominal contents to infection, as well as the development of a hernia. This is the displacement of an organ from its normal body cavity. This may result in the loss of normal blood supply, followed by necrosis to the organ. Another complication are keloids. Keloids are an irregular mass of scar tissue that protrude from the surface of the skin. This is usually the result of overproduction of collagen during the healing process. You can also get proud flesh. This is an overproduction of the granulation tissue. This too may protrude from the wound surface and interfere with the reepithelialization process, and the wound may become infected. Some of the requirements for healing. First, you need to clean away any debris, clear away any extraneous material. These will just increase the chance of infection and delay the healing process. So this is a debreeding, uh, especially with uh, burn patients or if there's uh, glass or gravel in the wound, it needs to be cleared away. Immobility, the movement near the edges of the wound will delay or prevent the healing process. So immobility, this is, uh, so it prevents the joining of the, of the tissues over the damaged area. This is why we immobilize bones and also why we use stitches. A good blood supply is needed. This is for the delivery of oxygen and nutrients. You see a delayed healing process in the elderly due to circulation deficiencies. Also, the same thing happens in diabetic patients. You need a good supply of, nutri of nutrients. You need extra protein. This is what collagen is made up of. You need methionine, which is an amino acid. This is used in the production of that mucopolysaccharide that is part of the extracellular matrix. You need zinc. This also contributes to the matrix formation. Vitamin C is required in the production of procollagen. And lastly, copper is used by some of the enzymes that promote cross-linking of the collagen fibers. Control and regulation of the healing process is not well understood. Uh, just a little aside, there is a, a wound care clinic that is sponsored and run by Damon that is instrumental in studying this uh, wound healing process. Why in some people do sores heal? Think uh, some of these complicated bed sores. Why do they heal for some patients and others just be, uh, keep getting worse and worse? This whole process is not well understood, but more and more information is being learned all the time. What we do know is that there are two chemical uh, groups of factors that play a role in controlling and regulating healing. 
One are growth factors, which will promote the growth, and others are growth inhibitors that will stop or slow down. They also feel that there is an interaction of the cells with the extracellular matrix, and this may play a role in the healing process. Another factor is contact inhibition. This is when dividing cells make contact with each other, mitosis stops. So again, you see when they come across and make contact, they stop growing. Here, this is a loss of con contact inhibition, and you can see uh, an ex increase or too much growth. This might uh, be what uh, uh, causes keloid uh, formations and proud flesh formation to happen.